The framers, I think, mentioned the freedom of the press in the First Amendment because they recognized the freedom of mass communication is a very important check, perhaps the most important check, on government power. And that's especially so in a democracy. In a democracy, the people govern, but the people have to be aware of what is happening. And the only way that they can learn what's going on, they can hear the arguments about what's going on, is if printing presses, and now their technological heirs, are free of government censorship. Political advertising is, generally speaking, fully protected by the First Amendment, subject only to narrow exception for libel. That's, in fact, what was involved in New York Times v. Sullivan, a political ad. Sullivan was a police commissioner who claimed that he was libeled in an ad that the New York Times published. Libel is defined as a false factual assertion about someone that damages the person's reputation. The contested statement came in an advertisement which accused local police of various kinds of misbehavior related to the civil rights movement. The police commissioner claimed that there were errors in the statement that were libelous and therefore he should be able to recover damages. And he sued the New York Times, got a massive verdict in Alabama courts, and then that went up for review to the U.S. Supreme Court. The court concluded that the First Amendment does apply to libel lawsuits. So political advertisements about public figures are fully protected by the First Amendment, subject only to the rule that knowing or reckless falsehoods are not protected. Reputation is very important to people, and the damage to the reputation could be extremely harmful to their lives and to their dignity. Some damaged reputation is inevitable uh, in public debate, especially about public uh, figures and public officials, and some of that damage may even be unjustified. But so long as people are refraining from intentionally lying, so long as people just sometimes make inevitable uh, honest mistakes in public debate about public officials and public figures, the Supreme Court held that speech has to be protected. So what the court said was that the plaintiff has to show by clear and convincing evidence if the plaintiff is a public official, that this defendant speaker actually knew the statement was false or was reckless. In practice, this knowledge or recklessness standard has been very hard for plaintiffs to meet. And I think the Supreme Court deliberately made it hard. New York Times v. Sullivan is important because it's important that people be able to freely discuss and criticize the actions of government officials. If every time you criticize a government official, you risk a lawsuit because of some innocent mistake, maybe even a reasonable factual mistake that you made, then in that case, the newspaper publisher or blogger might well be quite reluctant to make such criticisms. And maybe every time you're threatened with litigation, you'll immediately take them down for fear that you'll be bankrupted. So the Supreme Court concluded that because of that, there needed to be considerable immunities given to those who discuss public officials, even when they make mistakes in what they say about public officials. Because otherwise, there'd be so much of a chilling effect on speech, including true speech, that the public debate needed for democracy so that people will be able to decide whom to elect or re-elect would be stymied.